on the notice of intent uh, for 120 North Main Street, the affordable housing project. So again, we met previously a couple weeks ago, I think. Um, and at that time, um, it was determined that we, um, some they were gonna interact with the, with the ZBA and that there was gonna be a peer review process with regards to the uh, stormwater plan, management plan, and that we would meet again today to see how that's forth coming along. Um, and also we've had some additional correspondence from uh, concerned residents with regards to the filing as well. So maybe we can hear from uh, the proponents to find out where things are with regards to the CBA and the peer review process. Sure, um, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, Laura Baker, I'm working as a project manager for this project. Um, what I remember from two weeks ago is that one of the reasons the hearing was continued was because there was not a DEP file number yet assigned for the right. project. Um, we're not sure how, why that happened. They cashed our check a while ago. Um, but I brought copies of the DEP file um, along with a couple of other attachments. Um, the DEP requested a couple of items. They didn't give a lot of comments um, on the NOI, but they gave a few. And so um, I wanted to give the board a copy of the filing, uh, the TSS removal chart that they requested. Um, I have the uh, endangered species maps for the region, uh, showing that this property obviously isn't in uh, endangered species area, um, as well as some photographs of the site in question on days when it was dry out there in case we get into a conversation about the fact that it's sometimes wet and sometimes dry. So I'll just give those out. Um, I will uh, share with the board that uh, the ZBA has signed a contract with a peer engineering firm called Niche Engineering. Um, so we believe they are ready to start their work. Um, and I think the goal is for them to complete that work and give a peer review report uh, on or about sometime around the first week of January. Um, so one question I had for this board um, was whether it's ever permitted to issue orders of conditions, one of the conditions being the receipt of a satisfactory uh, peer review report. I don't know if that's possible or not, but it came up as a, a thought that I had. Um, I, I wasn't aware of any particular concerns that the board members had with the stormwater management report. Uh, obviously, uh, Mark, Mark is here who did the stormwater report. And so he could field any questions that the board might have about that report. Um, so just a thought in terms of moving the process forward and not getting stalled, kind of waiting for one board to act. Well, another board, uh, um, we do, and the ZBA, I, I think we concur that there's kind of a parallel process, um, that they don't have jurisdiction over the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, they only have jurisdiction over kind of local permitting issues. Um, so it's possible that they could be going on in parallel track. Okay, thank you. Um, so this number one note from DEP, again, um, it, they're suggesting that the commission may want to receive additional information on the proposed hand removal of invasive species and consider allowing that work to continue as an ongoing condition once the project is completed in the sort of certificate of compliance has been issued. So again, that. We can respond to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was actually left over from the previous um, submission for the RDA on sheet L2. There was a note that was on there that should have been removed. It wasn't. I think it's um, there's a note at this location, and a note reads, um, Allow natural succession of wetland vegetation. No mowing or other work shall be allowed other than hand removal of invasive species. And we assume that's not going to be required or the commission could condition the order in any way they would like. But that's the only note, only place that the word regarding invasive species and removal was on the plan. Right. And as we talked about at the last meeting, that certainly we, um, Certainly, there is no way that we could 
maintain that in early successional habitat according to the wetland regulation. So there was some concern expressed with regard to invasive species as the area goes through succession and such like that. I know Mark had a particular concern about that. And, um, and didn't you have some correspondence with, someone had some correspondence with, with Mark Stinson? On no, that? it was just when he emailed us the, oh, okay. the DEP gotcha. number. Gotcha. So but certainly that remains a concern for the commission that, um, that invasive species may become very dominant within that as the, as the wet meadow uh, succeeds into other uh, systems. So that's something that we could consider as a part of the orders and conditions as well. Yeah, we wouldn't want to prohibit the hand removal of invasive species. And we might end up conditioning that that is uh, something that happens, that can happen. Um, and the... Uh, the mention of underground stormwater chambers are subject to the UIC program requirements. Yeah, I can speak to that too. Uh, that's a uh, requirement of Massachusetts. Anytime you have an underground uh, system that actually injects water, surface water, et cetera, it has to be registered with the state. This is not unique to this project. Any dry wells that you have within the state are required to be registered. So if and this is constructed after that point in time, it's a requirement from the owner to register that with DEP. Because mm -hmm. I assume the tanks that you designed were done within those those requirements, correct? Again, these requirements primarily are basically that you have to register okay. with the state so they'll know where all the locations are. And it is there are certain requirements associated with it too, but uh, it does meet those requirements. Um, maybe you could work. Um, Laura mentioned that the additional TSS spreadsheets were included. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, that was only uh, the, it's a suggestion that most notice of intents have the TSS removal um, Excel sheet included. Be primarily if you have several different BMPs, there's a specific mathematical process that you have to follow, and that sheet uh, does that. The fact that we have just the one. We did not include that, but uh, since the DEP requested it, we did prepare one and have submitted to you and copy the DEP. So maybe it'd be useful if you work through that with us, so everyone understands. Yeah, the uh, the sheet essentially the first line is a what type of uh, best management practice you have to remove um, total suspended solids, and we only have one, which is the focal point uh, proprietary tree well, essentially. And it removes, I believe, 78 percent. That was the lowest percentage. They have several different percentages, but that was the lowest one that they have. And so we are removing greater than 70 percent, which meets the state requirements for TSS removal. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so it sounds like that calculation is only pertinent to one of the outfalls and wouldn't be pertinent to the outfall to the north of the site, which is the Grassland channel, and so what are the TSS calculations for grassland channel? Nice for that. The TSS TSS removal is only for uh, impervious surfaces, and all the impervious surfaces other than roofs on our site are taken through the and require TSS removal. Overland flow, grass flow off of grass, etc., does not require TSS uh, additional treatment or BMP. So there is no requirement for removing TSS from non impervious surfaces other than roofs. It's my understanding that all of the snow melts on this site will be pushed to the edge of the property, <coughs> the edge of the property that's closest to, to my field, and that the snow melt will then go into that grassland channel so then there would be um, sediment associated with that snow melt. And it sounds like there's no plan for um, those suspended solids or that sediment to be dealt with. So that is not accurate. So we brought a, a chart tonight showing oh, that's great. where we've shown it uh, a couple of times, but it's showing where the um, snow plow areas are. Um, and especially wanted to note for um, the concom that I think with one exception, everything is outside of This is the, the buffer, zone. buffer zone of this location here. So basically, it's all outside and the buffer zone. And the red areas are where all the snow storage would occur. We obviously be slightly different than that, but again, this is the buffer zone location. 
we are proposing to put some of the snow storage on top of the focal point location, which would obviously um, filter and accommodate the uh, NATS removal. And then this is snow melt on the grass, and it's snow melts on the grass, the sediments are hard, mostly there's sand and snow accumulations that will slowly melt and be accumulated in the grass. And then there's a gentle half percent swale that comes through here uh, on the north side. But that would go right into the burning vegetation. All, all water from all snow melts ultimately goes into wetlands and water. That's, that's not unique to this particular project. What's unique to this project, though, is the addition of a parking lot. And all the parking lot areas will be treated for the focal points and the snow, which happens to be piled up on occasion. And any sediment in there would be a, of an opportunity to uh, be collecting the grass. And again, all of the snow except for this location here, proposed to be stored outside of the buffer zone. I hear that you're proposing to store it outside of the buffer zone, but it's going to melt into the buffer zone. Right, all water ultimately goes to the buffer zone or the storm wetlands when it melts. And right now, the water is able to move very slowly through a natural system, <coughs> recharging the bordering vegetated wetland and slowing down the flow of the water. With the proposed system, that the, with the grass line channel, you're you're altering the natural flow of water. I'm not saying that I'm, it's, no, it's not going to snow more often just because of the project, right? We're not going to like you're, we're not we're not changing something other than where the snow is going, and you're pushing snow to the edge, not allowing it to melt naturally, right? That's the that's the change. You're because it, it's impervious. You're, you, the snow isn't melting naturally there. So with salts and with sediment being pushed up to the edge, all of that is going to end up entering the bordering vegetated wetland. The melting snow, the water leaving there, yes, it will it'll have an opportunity to uh, infiltrate as it goes slowly through this 1%, half percent swale. So if I can make sure we're understanding this line of questioning, <laughs> uh, is that certainly all the water will eventually end up in the wetland, uh, and the question has to do with uh, the the TS the sediments coming out of the snow or whatever else is accumulated on the parking area, and that's what Margaret's concerned about in terms. And so I think the the uh, developers proposing that yes, there will be sediments associated with snow removal in the parking lot, but that these systems are designed in such a way that those sediments will be trapped either by the, the system uh, to the south of the project or within that grassy swell, and this will occur outside the buffer zone, will not be occurring within the buffer zone. And so I assume y'all are proposing that because of this, uh, it's not an activity that's occurring within the buffer zone, and also that, so consequently, it's not an activity that will have an adverse effect on the wetland resource area. That's correct. And I, I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, the requirement for TSS removal is on an annual basis. It's not each and every individual storm requires 80% TSS. It's an annual requirement. And you will have some occasional snowstorm with occasional snow being plowed onto the sidewalk or to the grass areas. But again, TSS removal is based upon an annual average. So I'm extremely confident that uh, normal rainstorms will be accommodated and properly addressed for this project. So certainly, I uh, believe in the original filing, there was a proposal by which to do the normal maintenance on the system. Um, but is there any need by which to propose that for the swell as, as well? in terms of the expectations of the sediments that may end up in that? Yeah, it should be inspected annually. If there's any accumulation of sediment, it needs to be removed and maintained. Uh, the, the focal point systems have a you know, uh, biannual uh, review on the first couple of years to make sure that are properly working. But the grass channels, these are very flat channels, very wide channels, grassed, not receiving an extremely large amount of flow. We don't anticipate uh, maintenance issue associated with those. Margaret, you had a question? Yes, I do. And my concern is that although I understand that the TSS calculations are um, by, by Mark show that annually things are going to be okay, that when you average all of the storms out, it's going to be okay. 
the bordering vegetated wetland itself will experience harm from, from runoff events and from increased flow. And those things happen, those things can happen just from one big storm. Right now, there's ample area to absorb water and creating such an increase of impervious surface on this landscape will change the hydrology of the wetland itself because the, the increased flow and the lack of water storage capacity on that land could really change things quickly. Like the wetland doesn't care what happened five months ago if in the middle of June there's a huge storm. You want to speak? I mean, the yes. whole purpose of the stormwater management plan is to address Margaret's concern. So it's to provide storage, it's to slow down the flow of water, and it's calculated to handle large storm events. And Mark can certainly walk us through that I, that process. And we also provide recharge and you know, basically tries to mimic as best it can uh, pre construction conditions. And these guidelines have been developed by DEP to. If they're followed strictly and we exceed their, their requirements to ensure that the stormwater has no detrimental impact to the uh, resource areas, primarily BBW, land subject flooding, et cetera, that's why they have these regulations and processes involved and, and instituted so that we can make sure that we're not in detrimentally impacting the resource areas. So the stormwater plan creates new areas for holding water, basically. It creates detention systems underneath the parking area. Um, and there are mechanisms in place to, to do a very slow release of water um, so that all the water can get back where it belongs, but there's no erosion, there's no kind of gushing water heading back there. And I assume the peer review will examine these issues as well with regards to their expert opinion as well. Uh, Margaret, I think you sent us an email with regard to you're concerned that only one outlet was shown, is that correct? Could you That's right. share with sure. us your concern? Yes, that? thank you, sir. Um, I spoke, I raised this issue with Mark Stinson from MassDEP, and he suggested I bring this to your attention. Within the notice of intent, it is my understanding that the developer has identified one stormwater outfall, and there is a fee associated with each stormwater outfall. Based on my understanding of the no, reading the full notice of intent and attending these hearings, it's clear to me that there are two stormwater outfalls in this project. And based in that, with that understanding, it seems to me that either you need to pause these hearings and identify further information regarding the second outfall, or um, or otherwise, you know, determine determine what's appropriate because both stormwater outfalls weren't identified in the notice of intent. Okay. Um, can I respond to that. Sure. Um, there are two points of discharge. One takes overland natural flow and redirects it to the location it was going before. The other point source discharge is one that we're quantifying that we're we're treating it, manu you know, man managing it to the point that we're complying with the stormwater requirements. We did evaluate the swale on the north side of the project to ensure that it did not exceed velocities or erosion, uh, erosion velocities, so we checked the volume of water going there, and that 99% of that water is coming from off-site, and we're just directing it around our site to continue, make sure it has the same destination, and we did check again for velocity for erosion purposes. Um, if it is the board's decision, that the consider the northerly swale a second uh, point source discharge. I think the ramification would be a discrepancy on the application uh, fee, which, in my understanding, is something that can be rectified. It has no bearing on the hearing process, other than the fact that the fee, if the board so decides, could be adjusted to accommodate the second point source discharge. So why wouldn't we want to consider that a second? Point source. Pardon? Why? Wh why wouldn't you want to describe? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the argument well, for not considering it? Well, we, we, we're in the opinion that if there's is natural flow flowing in the same direction. It's not flows that we're creating. We're not flows that we're augmenting. 
it's existing flows that are uh, entering to our site and we're just directing it around. And so it's not a flow that we control or we have to manage regarding, uh, we looked at it from peak flows to see, but we're, we're actually decreasing the flows that were coming to the site by grabbing our site and putting it into detention. So it was our opinion that we were just directing existing overland flows coming to our site and we're not creating a new point source discharge. It's at the board's discretion to go whichever direction you would so feel. We are channelizing it, that's true. And so that's uh, the board's decision. Margaret? Thank you, sir. You make me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me ma'am if you want. <laughs> um, I've got the grades over here. Um, so it, 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 in my understanding, it is not true that 99, whatever you said, Mark, percent of the flow from that northern portion is unchanged because we just talked about how snow melt is going up there. Snow melt from the parking lot. And, and that's, that's a huge concern of mine. So snow melt from that parking lot is entering the grassland channel and is absolutely a point source. And I think we really need to take a much closer look at it because that water is going to be flowing directly through the bordering vegetated wetland if this project gets, to, gets built. So, you, so the, the, the outfall to the south of the property um, is very close to the edge of the BBW and might have, um, but, to have but to have two outfalls to the north and to the south, both of which could very well cause harm to the BBW and alter its flows change its pH, you know, change all kinds of things. Uh, I really encourage the board to take a very close look at this, at the outfall and name it as such and really make sure that it would be acceptable and appropriate and that this wouldn't be causing um, alteration of the resource area. I believe it will. Turning to our engineer colleague here, this, this argument for the channelization may not to another point source. I mean, is there additional flow to the point source than existed prior? I guess that's the question I'd have. Is it, yeah, is it changing um, the flow or changing mm -hmm. the volume of water that gets there? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, again, we're it's, the drainage area maps, I guess, is probably yeah. the, the best way to resolve that question. Um, approach the board. Sort of difficult to. Yeah, no, I understand. But this is the existing condition plan, which we had the entire site draining this yep, way. Yep. And then, so this entire site was draining Oakland here. And by drawing this line here, this area here, which is flowing towards this location, yep. we essentially have directed, captured the water, around. and sent it around. Okay. What is this called? This is a proposed drainage scenario, proposed drainage map, and this is the existing drainage map. Okay. These are both included in the NOI application in the stormwater report, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I invite the audience to come look at these if you would like to. So again, this water in this developed yep. area yep. Is, is, is existing. We're not changing the characteristics, the cover or anything else on it. Yep. Uh, so we're just capturing it and letting it go and go reach its ultimate original destination. Our developed area, we're actually capturing it, treating it detaining it, recharging it, and releasing it at a controlled velocity of the location. I don't want to speak for Margaret, but I think it, certainly it's all going to end up in the same place. Correct. After versus pre-development. Uh, I think Margaret's point is is that um, it's, it's capturing it here within this drainage swell. So in a sense, it's constant, although the volume is going to be the same coming here, the, it's going to be concentrated here, which I think, Margaret, correct me if I'm wrong, you're arguing that that constitutes another point source mm -hmm. of the water that's yeah. probably uh, not as uh, as concentrated as it is in the existing conditions. Right. And doesn't P2A include a portion of the roof line? Yes. Uh, you mentioned until today, this section of the roof here, it flows into that swale. Right. That's correct. And so I think that would, to me, that's the answer to your question. Regarding... Dan's question. Well, another, well, just if there's a change in the volume and... Yeah. On the beginning of the total yep. volume here, it's, yep. it, we didn't this, separate the existing and proposed at this point. Yep. Um, again, we make sure that the velocity at the 
as a swell swelled out. And we chose this line as our control point. We have to choose a control point. And we show ensure that the peak flows and water quality to the wetlands are the same. So uh, I, I briefly remember looking at Mark's comment to Margaret's email to him, Mark Stinson at DEP. And I think his words were something like, good catch, right? Uh, suggesting that uh, DEP was also possibly considering this as a second point source discharge area and that um, it might, he didn't suggest this, my interpretation is that it might be in the best interest of the developer to identify this and um, pay the appropriate fee. There's an additional fee associated with it. Is that correct? hundred dollars. hundred dollars or something like that. I don't think that was in Mark Stinson's comment, was it? Uh, I don't, no, no, this, this is not, I'm speaking for myself, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to interpret what uh, uh, Mark may have been suggesting, but he didn't say that at all. I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, Mark uh, may, DEP may very well be considering this a second point source and that it might behoove the developer to recognize that and file whatever might need to be filed if this is a mistake that's been done that needs to be updated, simply in order to potentially avoid any other um, problem down the line with the garden fire. I think the only rectification uh, would be to adjust the fee for a second district mm -hmm. to sort of discharge. Right. And show it on them, recognize it on them. In the narrative. I mean, typically they're not a narrow point in, say, point source discharge locations. Mm -hmm. If you're cognizant and know how to read an engineering plan, you can recognize those point sources that are not labeled specifically right. as point source discharges right. on the plans. Agreed. Pardon? I agree with that for, for sure. But, Dan, does it make sense to you that it might be a second point source? I mean, yeah, I mean, if it's a place where water is, it's a change location, there's more water going to that point, I guess. I could see the argument, and it, but it's, you know. So does that mean, if I'm asking the question of, can, does that mean that the peer review could include review of calculations ensuring that this point source is both accurately mapped and that those calculations are double checked? That's, I mean, would that be included in the peer That's review? my understanding of what the peer review is going to do. So. All those calculations yeah. are in, yeah. and yeah. still more calculations addressing both those right. locations. Right. I think all the data has been submitted for the peer review. It's just a matter of saying, them stating that and paying the extra fee that there's a second point source discharge area. And that fee does not come to the ComCom? Um, I don't know. Well, it's a state fee, so it's it goes to DEP. And we get a proportion of the filing fee, but um, but yeah, I don't know. Okay. It's the first time I've dealt with this, so I don't know. Okay. Does anyone know? Well, we'd be happy to talk with DEP directly. I mean, the comment that they made on the file number was that they initially perceived that it was a complete submission. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's changed, um, we can certainly talk with them. I guess I would encourage you to. Because Mark indicated it was a good catch on Martha. On this is Margaret's the first part. we're hearing about that. <laughs> but uh, that's a quote from from Mark's email. He, uh, actually, let the record show he called me a sharp lady. A sharp, oh, okay, there you are. <laughs> there you are. And again, so we're talking early January. You think it's when the peer review is going to be completed? And so, um, so essentially, the the ZBA is not planning to meet again until that peer review is done. Correct. They've scheduled a meeting for January tenth. Um, the original schedule for the peer review was to have that due on uh, January seventh. Mm -hmm. um. So, um, so we're. I think we have a couple of choices tonight to make. Okay. Um, if we think the information is sufficient by which to close the hearing and issue a order of condition, that's one option. 
another option would be to continue the hearing until we receive the information from the peer review that may affect our writings of orders and conditions in one way or another. Does anyone see any other options in like, front of us? It sounds like the two, that's the two I see. <laughs> Continuing to take public comment regarding. Sure, well if we continue the hearing, certainly the, the, that option is available, certainly. Is, is it possible the way that orders sometimes anticipate future events to have orders that say we need to deliver a satisfactory peer review you know, prior to construction or something like that so that you know that there's that follow-up step coming to you of having that peer review arrive? So I, think, I think because we have to issue the orders of condition by a certain date, the timing might not allow us to have conditions that reference that peer review result. Right, let's say if the peer review comes back very different or potentially different than what has been presented, then we might very well need to change the orders and conditions in order to adjust for that. So I would think it'd be very premature to issue orders and conditions now in advance of the peer review process. Even if it's satisfactory, yeah, there might be things that we, yeah. we might want to include in the orders that just supplement it or reinforce wording. Yeah, because if something why. really strange came back, uh, we don't really have a process by which to amend the orders and conditions that we've already written. So. Yeah. Our, our next regular scheduled meeting would be January 15th, hmm. but we could continue to any date announced at the meeting today. Right. So, um, again, this needs to be done with the permission of the applicant, uh, with the, in agreement with the applicant to continue a hearing. Um, I just think it's important that we, uh, if we choose to continue it, that we continue it to a date that's going to be post uh, the peer review report coming in. So one question would be, do we fully anticipate the 15th, that the Tuesday. peer review will be in advance of the that January 15th? Uh, you know, that is what their agreement tells us. It's the 16th, actually. And um, I can give you guys a copy if you haven't 16th. seen it yet. Um, yeah. It states, oh, the Sunderland ZBA anticipates receiving the 40B revised sub submission by December 6th, which we did, and submit the letter to the ZBA prior to the January 7th hearing. January 7th. I mean, the hearing's actually the 10th, but that was how this language was drafted. Um, that's all we've got to go on at this point. Um, I mean, that's certainly the intention right. of the peer review. It's the intention of the ZBA to kind of queue everything up so that we're not having hearings without having that information. Right. Now the 15th, it seems like... 16th. No, the 15th, you're right. 15th. Well, well the, first, the, year. <laughs> first, <laughs> the first would be January 1st, which oh. is a holiday. Right. So the third Tuesday is January 15th. Gotcha. I have a question regarding the peer review. We learned on December 6th at the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting that the Zoning Board of Appeals Chair would coordinate with you, Kurt, the Chair of the Conservation Commission, uh, to request input on the peer review, knowing that the Zoning Board of Appeals would not be asking any questions regarding the bordering vegetated wetland or flows impacting the bordering vegetated wetland, that any questions that would usually, that, that the Conservation Commission would usually ask of a peer review through an NOI process, as you have, as you are rightfully able to do so, that, that, the, that, the, that the Zoning Board of Appeals peer review would not address anything relevant to the Conservation Commission if those questions were not proactively provided to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And so my question, I know that I, had, I sent my list of 20 questions to Steve and to you, Kurt, for consideration and inclusion in the charge to the peer reviewer. My question is whether the Conservation Commission has had a conversation about questions to provide to the peer reviewer and um, whether you might need an additional peer review or any additional consultations if, this, if the ZBA peer review will not meet your needs. 
Did you, you spoke with Steve on this issue? No, it was an email and it was my, he wanted to move forward on the peer review. So we were saying yes, move yeah. forward on the peer review and that we didn't have a list of set questions that it was more to review the the calculations and the mostly because we didn't have Dan for follow-up questions at the meeting and I it wasn't any other additional questions that would go beyond that so yes it's, it's coming back to me that email that um, that the peer review was really going to be focused on the stormwater management that's where our outstanding questions were mm -hmm. uh, and that so we thought that the, that charge was sufficient for answering the conservation commission's needs so i would also note that there were a lot of questions at the last hearing two weeks ago that margaret brought forward related to stormwater management plan and that mark addressed at that time so if those questions were answered to the satisfaction of the commission I don't know that those questions then have to kind of go to the ZBA and go to the, the peer review engineer as well. It seems like if they've been asked and answered to your satisfaction, that that's enough. Right, right the chair, you, the chair of the ZBA and, and Kurt, we're going to review questions that have been submitted, not just Margaret, but for anyone else, and see what needed to move forward. So I don't know where that's at. Right, right. that hasn't been done. But um, I think what Laura just commented on is fairly accurate in that, you know, we've had lots of questions prior to this and they've been asked and answered and that the Conservation Commission's concern was primarily a verification of peer review of the stormwater management because we felt like we didn't have uh, the expertise on hand to uh, evaluate all the technical aspects of the stormwater management plan. And that's why we depend on the peer review to make sure that it's all uh, correct. Mm -hmm. I also mm -hmm. I also heard the commission name that there might be impacts to the habitat, biota, and um, the resources ex existing within the BBW, and none of those questions will be asked or answered by the ZBA's peer review. Mm -hmm. So none of the, none of the- We don't uh, think we need a peer review to answer I, that. I, I okay. heard Kurt say that the, the commission itself felt qualified to field those right. questions. Exactly. I reported that again to the ZBA that that, that was, you were very clear that you had the background mm -hmm. and the understanding to do that as an independent body and you didn't need a peer review engineer to, to weigh in on habitat issues. That's right. So may I ask the question, sure. the list of questions that I sent to you for inclusion in the peer review, what has happened to that list of questions? Uh, they were sent on, Steve had them, and so he took those into consideration when he gave the charge for the peer review process to occur. May I request a list of the questions that were given to the peer reviewer? You can request it to Steve. I don't know that I have a copy of those, because that was a ZBA. Uh, process but yeah and I would suggest since so many of the questions were covered two weeks ago if there's ample time tonight maybe since Mark is here Dan is here you know if if this is possible to ask and answer some questions and not be paying multiple parties to ask and answer the same questions maybe we want to do that I, I don't know this I think that's an excellent suggestion so do you have additional questions you would like to ask or anybody else here would like to ask with regards to yes sir. Does Dan have any more questions? Mike Ahern 127 North Main across the street from this project. The groundwater is always something in the springtime that we have to deal with on our side of the street and more so on the opposite side of the street. When Warner built their project, they brought fill in. Now you have 70 pieces of equipment over there. So that created what we're dealing with now. 
this project is going to bring 50 parking spaces plus the building size and the street. It's going to have an impact on where that groundwater is pushed, I think. So should we be planning on buying two sump pumps? Because we already know that we're having wetter seasons. You know, the ground is now saturated from what we had this year. The Quabbin's overflowing. And people say that this is only going to get more and more. And that really should be a consideration of this site itself is wonderful to think that this project would go ahead, but there will be other sites in the future for a project like this. We don't have to do this at this site. We already seen like Cozy Corner is now going to be available. There's going to be other places. We don't have to sit this on this piece of property. That is all true. However, from a regulatory perspective, right, that's not under the purview of the Conservation Commission whatsoever. Uh, we don't deal with alternative sites that are available. We, we're obligated to follow the, the state wetland regulations and saying, do they meet the performance standards for the state laws? And if they do, and that's the only jurisdiction we have, and if they do, then we put orders on the conditions and we approve it. If not, then we deny it if they can't meet the performance standards. So what you're saying is exactly right, but we simply don't have the administrative authority, legal authority to say, hey, this isn't the best site to do it, go somewhere else to do it. We just can't tell a proponent that. But you don't deny the fact that this is going to have an impact on us that are already there and pumping in the spring. It's not clear to me that that is the case. Um, my understanding is that all the water on this site will still be contained within the site and that all the water presently going into that wetland will continue to go into that wetland in the future um, and that their stormwater management has been developed with the understanding that um, it will be enter into that wetland resource area in a way that will not be harmful to it is what they're proposing and that's what the peer review is proposing to look at with regards to the stormwater management plan um, you know the, the the question of of do you need more sump pumps due to this project uh, no, one is never going to have enough sump pumps to deal with high groundwater, right? It's an impossibility. There's just too much volume of groundwater by which to deal with that. So we've seen that time again in the Meadowbrook area that we had a town select board meeting on uh, last week. And so uh, these things change, groundwater changes. And um, so it's... It, <laughs> They're, they're obligated to meet the regulations of law. And so they have proposed a way by which they're going to do that to meet those, those performance standards. I will say it's not the same regulations that were in place when Warner Brothers put in that, con that paved pad that is like a dam now. And all the water does get pushed off or under a pipe, wherever that pipe goes. Um, so the regulations are designed to prevent that pushing of water that we can picture happening. Um, so that's one of the things that the stormwater peer review will look at to see if the calculations are really showing that that groundwater is going to stay doing what it's doing on site in the normal flow that happens now and that isn't going to be pushed off. Well, so, but, and, you know. At the last meeting, they said they're going to put a seven feet of fill just for the project. You know, and, and you got the road, that's 18 feet of width, and then you got 51 parking spaces. So, 41 actually. It's all going to have an impact. Yeah, the groundwater is all under that though, so there's still pervious ground under for the groundwater to flow, and that, that flow is to go the same direction that it's going now. Well, when Warner put theirs, 
that had the impact that created the wet that we're dealing with now. When you put this in, that's also going to have an impact and create. Yeah, they, all that, all the impervious land there is what shedded water off without having a place control for it to go to. So it went mostly to one side, but it went to the other side too. So both ends are wet. So this, they have this whole system now that should channel that and treat it so that it's not just pushing off. But. I'm not an engineer, so I'm leaving it to the peer review experts right. to see if that's what happens. One thing that may bring comfort is that when Warner Brothers did that, we believe, they put a catch basin in to help alleviate the wetness in this BBW area. And who knows how long it's been gummed up and covered. Um, it's now uncovered, and if, in fact, the commission gives orders to keep it open, then in a large storm event, when the water gets high enough, it will, it will just run down there and it has a place to be released from this site. And I think that's a change over what may have been happening the last couple of years. Um, we haven't proposed anything to do with it because we don't want to be working in the wetland at all, um, but it's certainly a thought for the commission to um, give orders that that would be maintained as an open uh, inlet, and so that would also help. Mark's calculations assume, don't assume that. They assume it's kind of dammed up the way it's been the last couple of years. So changes coming to this site just based on that alone, um, if it's, you know, again, if it's maintained in an open condition or a closed condition, it's going to change the conditions um, for that wetland area. And again, downstream landowners may have an opinion on opening or closing that that as well so. no one seems to know where that pipe goes either yeah yeah it's a mystery <laughs> it's a mystery pipe <laughs> so um i get that uh you know obviously we're talking about a change of use for this property but it seems to me that what we're doing here is uh, first of all relying on a lot of engineering and uh more stringent regulations to control the impact of it, and that we're looking at an allowed use, and we're here to make sure that we're doing it according to the laws and the regulations, and that's our whole purpose of being here, not to, we're not trying to pretend we're not doing something out there, we're trying to do it right. Mm -hmm. um, I have a comment on Mickey's statement about groundwater, and I do hear you that the board is um, in charge of determining whether the calculations are appropriate and um, whether there might be alteration of the BBW, and that but and that it is appropriate to look at points of data that are relevant to concerns like groundwater. And I, I know I made this point and raised this concern at the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. But I guess should ask a question first of Mark that it's my understanding that there's a um, an assumption that groundwater does not exist within the top 12 inches of soil in your calculations. Is that true? We did extensive um, soil borings in the locations of the detention systems and determine where the groundwater is, and it's listed in our calculations and our soil logs. And it varies, I think, from 22 inches down to 40 inches as we get up towards the uh, main street there. So, yeah, we, we determine based upon current engineering uh, criteria where the groundwater is, based upon soil modeling and historical data. So, so again, that there wasn't, that there isn't groundwater in the top of soil. I, I'm not sure if I'm following when you're, when it rains, it tops, the ground's going to be wet, and maybe puddles out there. Right. Without no, question, surface water puddles. may drop down, but the groundwater elevation right. is, is determined based upon standard uh, engineering and soil analysis. Right. I understand that. So my question is about the depth of, of groundwater, though, and the, um, so the O'Reilly, Talbot, and Ogan report 
log of boring SSH5, which um, I can either identify, which is, if this, if this is my house, it's in this corner up here. That shows groundwater in at inch number 10. And I'm naming that because there's high groundwater at this site. And there's also a lot of surface water on this site. And uh, I'll call the attention of the board to the, um, the Google Drive photos and videos I have I've taken and shared showing the extent of surface water and also showing I found one of the soil test pits. And that whole entire test pit was full of water. Just, just maybe three centimeters under the, the, like, under the surface of the water. So not contiguous to any other water, but a huge, a huge amount of water. And I believe that the way these calculations were done discounts the amount of water storage capacity that exists in the buffer. And that, the, and that creating such a heavy building and all of this fill is really, really going to impact the BBW. Would you clarify which O'Reilly Talibus sure. boring you're referring to? SSH5, and it means that there was rusting in the bottom two inches of the of the twelve of the of the first foot. In my reading of this report. I mean. Oh, may I approach? Um, while they're looking, I, I just have a comment also. Yesterday, I drove around Sunderland, I looked out, I saw field after field after field with standing water, just everywhere. I went on this site, I walked back, I actually included a photo because there was no standing water in the buffer zone. And there was no standing water in most of the actual BBW. When I got way back, I could see there was ice, there was a little bit of water. but. I was struck by the comparison with many locations in Sunderland that I could see standing water and in fact this particular BBW area was relatively dry compared to those other fields and the buffer zone there, there was no standing water at all. And I also uh, included photos that I took in July which was after a storm event uh, when we were dealing with the DEP appeal they said go out this is a great test case you know we got like crazy amounts of rain go out. Again, I took photographs and there was, there was no water there. Now, obviously, the, the photos that Margaret's provided show that, yeah, sometimes there's water there. Um, but we've been walking this site and looking at this site for several years, and I feel like this last season is a bizarre amount of water, and we have not normally seen standing water in that, in the wetland, never mind in the buffer zone. So. It, it, I'm trying to calibrate like just how much water is usually out there and it, it most times I've walked back there it's been I've not been walking yeah. in water and so. in, in one sense it's irrelevant how much standing water is out there because the wetland resource area boundaries have been determined by DEP that's the resource area so it makes no difference under the regulations if there's standing water there or not uh, I just want to clarify this <clears throat> regarding this um, Boring number five, the statement that there was rust modeling in the bottom two inches. That's the bottom two inches of sample number one, which went from zero feet to two feet. So in the bottom two inches of the two foot sample, they found evidence of modeling, which is right in line with what we found as well. 22 inches. So that's, that's at the bottom two inches of that Thank zero to two foot sample. I thought that that was one foot. The sample depth is over here on the left. S1 is zero to two feet. And they found modeling in the bottom two inches of the two foot sample. Thank you. So it'd be great to air questions like this that are simply technical misreads, mm -hmm. and then Mark can answer them, and then we don't need to kind of mm -hmm. yeah. carry them forward. Thank you. Okay. Did you want to? take Margaret's list and go through some of those questions or they've already been submitted to the ZBA so there's not really yeah the peer review already has the set of questions, questions so okay um, so it's additional right. questions but that we might want to talk if about if Margaret would like to 
address any of those questions while we have them have, here. That's fine too. I'm, I'm really interested to understand more the, um, the Mark's decision to Mark's calculations of the target depth factor of the Winooski soil. Okay. Um, <coughs> one of the processes for designing stormwater systems is you determine the requirement for recharge volumes. And recharge volume is predicated upon the amount of impervious area you have in a particular hydraulic soil group area. And, and based upon one of the criteria that we had when we went out and did these last test borings was to do three things primarily. One was to determine the hydraulic soil group for the different areas to quantify that we are correctly categorizing the hydraulic soil group. The other was to determine the exact groundwater elevation. So we dug the holes down, looked at the soils, determined where the groundwater was based upon modeling. The third was to determine a textual analysis of the soils at exact locations where we were going to propose detention recharge facilities. So those are the three reasons we went out there. Um, and so we made it clear determination of what were type D soils and a delineation of where the D soil started and B soil started. So in the areas that we designated as B soils, we used recharge volume based upon the classification of hydraulic soil group B. In areas where we determined that the hydraulic soil group was D, we used a recharge volume associated with that. We didn't do it based upon a general analysis of what USDA said from the giant scenario, we did very site-specific analysis. And one of the criteria is we quantify and, and determine that the uh, USDA classifications are correct or incorrect, and that was the process that we went through. All right, and soil maps are quite coarse. Correct, and we, we went out there specifically to, to find two A, right. B, C, D type soils. So you just talked about, Margaret had asked a question about why were tests done in some places and not in other places. And it sounds like you had a rationale in terms of where you put the test pits. Absolutely, yes. Um, we put the, again, again two criteria. We, we, we knew there was an approximate uh, a B, D soil classification differential uh, based upon U.S. Colonel Corps of Engineer delineation determination of how you make those classifications. We went there and essentially did a horizontal line through there to check it, yes, this is DDD soils. Oh, here's a change line, which happens to be B, and amazingly corresponded very closely to what USDA had out there. So that was one of the reasons we were digging the test pits. The other one is, it's a requirement from DEP stormwater criteria that you have test pits specifically in the exact location we're proposing stormwater management systems, especially for doing recharge. And that's what we dig, dig, uh, dug those other lo test locations and exact locations where we knew we were going to put stormwater discharge scenarios. And we do the textual analysis. It's not based upon A, B, C, or D at that time. We look and see what the soil texture is at the exact location where we're discharging. And we take the most restrictive soil classification we find there. And that gives us the most restrictive recharge rate. So we try to be as conservative as possible in our analysis. And the fact that no soil samples were taken from the location of the proposed level lip spreader or the proposed grass line channel. Yeah, the, there that? was no requirement to do a soil analysis at the discharge location of a level lip spreader. What we primarily do, what we primarily do, what we do is we check the velocity, escape the uh, velocity of the water leaving that site, and we check that against um, uh, what's an acceptable velocity. Uh, we utilize a um, chart that's actually in the Mass Highway Department, uh, Mass DOT uh, acceptable velocities for grass line channels, and we are greatly below that locate that, that, that situation. There's another chart in there for erodible velocities on erodible channels, which are not grass lined, uh, and we are actually less than the velocity acceptable for non-grass lash channels, except for one side, one category, and that is a fine sand, non-colloidal, unprotected channel, we do slightly exceed that velocity. We are not in a uh, unprotected, erodible, non-grassed, non-colloidal, fine sand channel. So we are well below the acceptable velocities for both of these um, discharge locations. 
Margaret? I have a question just while we're on soils. If yes. the soils, if the type of soils that are below where the building will be are taken into account, or is it more the fill that comes in? As an engineer, can you speak to how you keep a heavy building from compacting the ground below it? And then I'm visualizing the potential for a, a dam below. And if that did happen, where would the water go? It would still end up in the wetland. But do you, is there some kind of calculation that you do to figure out what's going to happen to the compaction? When you do compress it, it may change the transmissivity rate. Um, there's a we call it a K factor. If you compress it slightly, but uh, it will still transmit. And the rate of flow of groundwater is very slow. It's not a rapid thing. So if you did compress it, it may slow it down a little bit. It's not going to stop it. Um, so uh, I've not really seen calculations that are concerned with that scenario. Again, the water will still be able to flow in a downhill perspective. It's not creating a dam. We're not creating, uh, by compressing it slightly more than it is, would make it impermeable. It may slow down the rate of flow, but wouldn't stop the flow of water. Not unless you change the actual material in there. I would also comment that it's still a two and a half story wood frame building, which is pretty much what everybody's houses are. Yeah. So even though it's bigger, it's spread over a larger area, the actual vertical compression is it's like Same all of the houses. House. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a skyscraper, it's not. So the, the kind of geotech structural engineering is not anything mm -hmm. super sophisticated because it's not that much weight, honestly, for a building. Um, it's just, you know. It's, it's a bigger footprint than a typical house in Sunderland, but it's not any, not going to be any heavier than a typical house in Sunderland. Can I ask a question? I'm interested in that the, the inputs, such as the uh, target depth factor and the, the K number that you, did, that you had mentioned that would change the, um, would kind of alter with compression. And the compression, I was just saying to Robin, um, with all of that fill, you have so much more compression. It's, it's not just like a house, because you have seven feet of fill also on the site. And so with the compression of, you have the structure, then you also have seven feet of fill on this kind of gorgeous, spongy soil that's really able to take in water as it's pushed in from the wetland, and then it can flow slowly back into the BBW. So with that compression, of the fill and the building, that um, that K factor will likely shift, and I think that's something I want to get the Conservation Commission back to discussing the potential harm to the buffer as it as the as the buffer is named as important in Mass DEP regulations to the resource area itself, mm -hmm. and what we have here is a proposal to build entirely on the hundred foot buffer. And not only does Mass DEP regulation name the importance of the 100 foot buffer, it also, I know that DEP didn't say, said that regula regulatorily that 50 foot buffer, there isn't such a thing as a 50 foot buffer, but names the importance of, of, of having, having the buffer and that as, as a project would encroach onto the buffer, it is much more likely to cause <coughs> harm and cause alteration to the BBW itself. So I, I have focused on some of these calculations, trying to figure out what's being proposed and also determine um, kind of scientifically if, if, harm, if harm could be occurring. But zooming out, you know, looking at what we have right now on site, the gorgeous BBW with a very functional buffer, with a really functional buffer, and ecological services being provided, flood service capacity being provided, I'm interested in hearing how the commission is going to determine that the question of alteration. Because you've heard some of my arguments, not all of them, but you've heard some of them. And I'm, I'm trying to make the case that alteration will, will most certainly occur. And I'm wondering if the, if the commission um, can, can weigh in on how you are making a determination. How will you look at the harm, the, the true harm? There's no question that the buffer is being harmed. 
and whether the harm to the buffer will cause harm to the BBW. Right. So in their filing and in our first hearing, they worked us through those different interests of the act for that resource area. And so they made the arguments that their design would meet the performance standards with regards to each one of those interests that are represented on the, on the site. I want to clarify that the notice of intent named that there was not a fishery resource on the site, but there is a fishery resource on the site. So their plan did not address that. Um, the plans did not address fisheries. We did make a statement in the um, notice of intent, a verbal statement, that we didn't realize or didn't assume that there was a fishery location there. Um, that was the only statement that we made. Uh, if there is determined that there is a fishery, the impacts again would be non existent because we are managing all the stormwater which flows to the buffer zone in an appropriate manner. So impacts to the wetlands and the function of the wetlands. The, the issue is whether or not the function of the wetlands to protect fisheries is still preserved. And we are saying that yes, it does. It is preserved because we're modifying and adjusting the stormwater to be in strict compliance with the state requirements. And therefore, the wetlands ability to provide uh, fishery protection is not impaired by this project. Will the board respond uh, to that? I, I, for me, when I, I'm looking at the interests of the act and if harm is going to happen, I, I'm focusing on measurable and observable instances. So I know that me just walking on this floor is killing microbes and having harm, but I have to, for this, work on things that are measurable and observable. So. There are things that for the stormwater, we're gonna count, go with the calculations. For the wildlife habitat, I'm going with your observations, my own observations, and my understanding and knowledge of what's needed for the wildlife that's there. I put fisheries in with wildlife habitat as well. Storm, dormant, storm damage prevention has a lot to do with the flow of the water and what's observable and measurable. Um, public and private water supply, where is the aquifer? Nowhere near. Um, so I'm looking at those kinds of areas that we can sh see and, and know that there might be harm. So that's what I'm looking for to make my determination. Could you tell me, today if you stand on the sidewalk in front of this site, it all goes downhill. What's it going to look like when you put seven feet of fill and a three-story building on there? It's going to have an impact. There's going to be runoff. I noticed that your panel is a little different than the last meeting, and there was one member that was very concerned with roof runoff and 51 parking spaces and you know how, how much fills going in for the parking lots how much fills going in for the roadway how much different is this site going to look like from just standing on the sidewalk the site itself is going to look very different but what we're here to judge is what if, how is that wetland resource area going to change if at all that's the thing we're charged with, with reviewing. Not, not what's happening outside that 100 foot buffer at all. So yeah, the site will change very dramatically. So we're here to say, have, is their design done in such a way that it won't have an adverse effect on that wetland resource area? So that's, what, that's the only thing we focus on with regard to this review. Uh, you know, and so they have proposed that the, the engineering uh, characteristics of the site will meet those performance standards for no adverse effect to the resource area. So that's what we're looking at. I understand that. They, they want to build. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that it's all positive from their point of view. Sure. 
but it is going to have an impact on the buffer zone and the wildlife. You're no longer going to see that great blue heron out there feeding. Well, that's going to change. It's been proposed by by some members that actually the wildlife habitat will be enhanced by this because it won't be a mowed field every year. Um, so there's differences of opinion with regards to that. But again, it has to do with the wildlife habitat that's there in order to support wildlife. That's what we're judged to look at. That's what we're, we're, we're not there to count how many herons are there today versus in three years. We're judged by which to say, okay, what habitat characteristics are there and will those habitat characteristics still be there down the line? Well, they certainly won't. And, and they won't be because that wetland will change because it's been mowed for decades and it's gonna change in terms of the habitat structure there. It was an onion field, it was a potato field. Okay. It's gone through many changes. It has, it has. So we have to say- but What we're proposing mm -hmm. by this project is going to negatively impact the groundwater. Seven feet of fill with the size of that building and the roadways and the parking lots and three apartments in the existing house. They need parking. It's all going to change. So I'll and that water is going to get pushed, so I feel, across the street. So I'd like to propose that you demonstrate that, OK? I've walked the site. Have, I've seen the water. Then give us the data. Give us the data that indicates that that's going to change. Because they work. They have the developers put in features that say we're not going to change the water flow into that wetland. Okay. And so, and again, both you and Mark keep saying the groundwater is going to change. The groundwater. Change. You need to give us evidence to that scientific engineering evidence that that's going to to happen in order to refute what they're proposing will not change that groundwater level. Because I can't, I can't just take your opinion of living there for 50 years. We need evidence and scientific data and engineering data to demonstrate it. The evidence that Warner's changed the site that we're now looking at that is the wetlands, this site is also going to change the existing property with what you're building. Warner's change everything to the north uh -huh. this is going to change everything that is wetlands now there's the evidence there's the history you can't refute it but it's being refuted by others okay well so maybe maybe rock warner refu refutes it because he loved his grandpa they're the ones who brought the fill they created what we're dealing with today. We're not debating Rock Warner's development of that 40 years ago. We're, we're focused purely on this existing resource area and the condition that it's in right now. That's what we're charged to look at and to assess what are the proposed impacts will occur or will not occur to this wetland resource area. And we've got a whole bunch of engineers presenting evidence to the contrary. We have a peer review group of engineers that are going to review their calculations. So what else other evidence do we need to do? Do we need to have a third one or a fourth one to review this again? I mean, we're going to engineering firms that have done these calculations. So you have to say, you'll have to admit, if, 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 you, if you stand by your say, you're saying, well, all of them are wrong. All of these engineering calculations are wrong. And by virtue of you living there your whole life. But again, at least they have the calculations by which to try to demonstrate their stance on it. And by law, that's what we're obliged to look at and assess. <coughs> and I realize that's not satisfactory to you, but what alternatives do we have other than our personal judgment without depending on these engineering calculations? All right. I have two points. One is that I believe it to be a false dichotomy that we, that I, that 
if this site is built upon that habitat would improve because it would no longer be mowed. This is now a state protected resource area. So if nothing occurs on this site, it, this site has the benefit of state protection. It is also my understanding that something like a conservation easement could allow this site to be maintained as early successional habitat as long as the habitat plan or the conservation easement were approved by MassDEP. This whole entire field could become protected under a conservation easement and would be very productive, important local habitat for years to come. So it is not true that because mowing will have stopped, this project would be improving future habitat because whoever owns this property is in charge of, of what happens and it's not it's just not true. It's not true that But we're not here ask we're not here asking that question. We're not here asking saying if someone buys a conservation easement on it, would the wildlife habitat be better? Mm -hmm. That's not the purpose of this filing. The purpose of this filing is to assess if their proposed activities are going to have an adverse effect on the resource area. Right. It's not to trade off if we put an easement or if we make it a national park that things would be better. I heard you say that this project would improve the habitat and that's what I'm naming is not true. That's no, fine. I you said that the, the stopping of the mowing is what will improve the habitat characteristics. The well, given that it's been an ag use and the town had it hayed a year or two ago, if could, even though it's a BBW, I thought you could still do agricultural work on that site. Are you saying that they couldn't continue to hay the site because it's now BBW, if it had been hayed for the last 80 years? Um, if it stayed in agricultural use, help me here. It could, it could continue to be hayed. It so it is a true statement that another user who bought this, who wanted to make a little money off their back land, would just say, yeah, local farmer, come and, come and hay it every year. That's what's always happened with it, and I can use the extra change and come and cut it. So that is a genuine potential use because of its history, even though it now is a BBW. And I had read that it could be lapsed for maybe up to five years and still be brought back into agricultural use. So that is one potential for this property if we weren't here. It's yes. just like to remind us that we're here because the town feels we have a real need for affordable senior housing. And we think this is a wonderful location for it. And we are moving, you know, and the goal is to do it within the regulations, within the laws, and protect the wetlands to the extent required while achieving this other goal. And it's sort of, and it, we're only here with conservation to deal with protecting wetland, not to debating the project itself, which has gone through a tremendous amount of scrutiny already. That's true. It has no bearing what the proposed use is mm -hmm. whatsoever. That is not within our jurisdiction. We just have to assess the potential effects of whatever is proposed. Jennifer, um, can I just ask you to speak briefly about your personal observation about how the site had already changed in terms of wildlife returning to it because it was no longer being mowed. I feel like you've lived in town for a long, long time and you're very observant about these. Um, yeah, I'm a, a swamp tromper. That's why. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> swamp rat. <The> but. Right <laughs> <place>. <laughs> yeah, no, it just, it speaks to that though, same issue. It's just, as a wildlife habitat, it has not had too much in it because it's been farmed and then grassed and so there hasn't been I haven't observed very much this year has been the double hit of no mowing and then lots of water so it helps and so you're seeing species. greater species diversity and better it's better habitat better habitat better wildlife habitat when it's not getting mowed yes yeah and how many years have you lived in town now? Only 20. <laughs> Only 20, and you've <laughs> walked a lot of that of the town and are super observant as a naturalist about what's out there. So I think, yeah, my, yeah. The reason I was looking there and other, other areas is looking for vernal pools, possible vernal pool areas. So 
trying to find vernal pools all over town. But that wasn't one of them. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name's Robin. Um, I have a question. My understanding is the applicant has asked for a waiver of the local bylaw, correct? Um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals, local and bylaw. Um, all right, is the commission going to provide any comments on whether or not that should be waived? And in reference to the buffer question, your bylaw suggests or requires a 50 foot vegetated buffer. How do you, how are you going to address that in terms of this particular project? Could when I just no buffer point, is required. Point of clarification. So the local bylaw says, may try to maintain a 50 foot undisturbed vegetated buffer whenever feasible. feasible. No, so, practicable. so yeah, practicable. practicable. Yeah. So even within the local wetland bylaw, there is not a hard and fast rule about those first 50 feet. There is still room for conversation and discussion and showing how protective measures can be put in place. I didn't, I mean, when I read it, it doesn't read as a hard and fast rule in Sunderland that you always have to maintain 50, 50 feet of undisturbed vegetative area. I'm not saying it's a hard and fast rule, but it's in your bylaw for a reason. Um, and I'm just trying to, to make sense of a project that proposes zero buffer in terms of how that relates to the right. protecting and, and uh, maintaining the resource values. So we've stated in previous meetings this that fact and that the Conservation Commission does have a concern that there is no 50-foot buffer there. Mm -hmm. And we had planned to most likely express that to the ZBA in their deliberations. Thank you. And I would just add as a point of context that the, the prior iteration, as we know of this project, uh, not only did it not have the 50-foot buffer area preserved, it was eating into what was then an isolated wetland area by, I don't know, 17,000 square feet. And it was a very large impact on that isolated wetland area. Um, and so I'm just hoping that people can see that there's been a lot of work done to improve the protection for the wetland that's on this site um, from where we used to be. Yes. Right. So the. Um, you have to go. Yeah. Okay. Just go. Okay. Are we? No. No. Well, uh, I might have to leave before she has it's a over. Probably needs to. Oh, okay. We're going to be voting on anything. <laughs> so that the question of that fifty foot buffer, I hear well, that you maybe, you're going quickly. to name that to the conservation well, then, then commission, but I have. I'm sorry, you're going to name that to the CBA, but I've yet to hear you discuss the square footage impacts, how many square feet of that 50 foot buffer would be impacted, and something like the, the impact of the soil compaction within that 50 foot, and the, the loss of the, of the water storage capacity. I do hear Mark describe a system that, that will handle some of the stormwater. I believe that the um, the target depth factor used in for the Winooski soil is. I I believe there is evidence that a different target depth factor should be used, which would create a larger required recharge volume, therefore showing that the available capacity will not actually suffice for for stormwater. So I, I heard you asking for specific detail, and, and some of the things we should talk about is the, how many square feet of that 50-foot buffer is being impacted. Why? Why? Uh, well, because it's named, it's named in no, the bylaw. No, our, our responsibility is to assess if their proposed activity in the buffer zone is going to have an adverse effect on the resource area. Mm -hmm. We do not have to do all the things you're asking about. We only have to address the question, is the proposed activity in the buffer zone going to adversely affect the resource area? That's what we're obliged to consider. Okay. So again, you bring up all these points, but again, if we're assessing what we're supposed to be assessing with regard to adverse impacts, we're meeting the requirements of what we're supposed to be doing. 
I don't want to interrupt, but since Jennifer has to leave, I would feel more comfortable if we could vote on whether or not we're going to continue the meeting until and, our next and meeting. And then the discussion can continue. And then the discussion can continue. So do I hear exactly. a motion to continue the hearing? Motion to continue the hearing. Second. Uh, to what day? The 15th. 15th of January. Um, so, Mark so discussion on this me. motion. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry, Mark informs me he's going to be away. On the 15th? Yeah, I have another hearing at Brimfield. Or Gardner. Could be. Do you know what year? Since the date is they're, they're discussing. Okay. If we're going to continue to that date or a different date. Because we need their agreement. To that. Yep. Um, I, I'm assuming it's important that Mark continue to participate since there are so many questions about stormwater that keep coming up. And if you're receiving the peer review, peer review and, it and seems trying important. to evaluate it, I, I think it's pretty critical that yep. you be available. Mm -hmm. So, um, is it possible to meet on a different night? Yeah. Or is, okay. I can't go rural here, I can go later. I can go the 16th. Mm. So, so the 14th is a Monday. No, I'm no. here in that night. You tell us when you can come. I'm in Agawam that night. Yeah, when you do when do you come that week, the 16th? Until, until the 14th, okay. So Dan is away until the 14th, just to clarify. So 16th so. or 17th seem 17th. to be on the table. That's a Thursday or Thursday. That's the Thursday, 17th. Fine, that's fine. That's good with us. Let me check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> check your calendar. He's probably not around. <laughs> okay. That is the week I'm at NCTC. No, no, no. no. I, uh, again, y'all can proceed without me if you want, though. No. I will be gone <laughs> teaching a course for the Fish and Wildlife Service that whole week of the 14th uh -huh. through the 18th. So, um, maybe we propose Tuesday. to do it the following Tuesday, the 22nd. Good, good for the, all. The twenty second planning board meeting going, going. Be on the second. Be on the second Tuesday. So that would be at seven thirty as well. So Tuesday the twenty second, right? 7 at seven thirty. And does the commission ant anticipate closing the hearing at that, that on that night and issuing orders? I hope so. Yeah, unless, unless um, the peer review the comes interview. back with big surprises. Right. Mm -hmm. So given that we'll have a, a gap of time between receiving the peer review and having that hearing, um, would it be appropriate to communicate to answer questions if something's popping up out of that? I mean, we can provide it to you just so we don't lose a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So yes, we just have to make sure we meet the open meeting law mm -hmm. requirements um, in that process. At what point does that peer review report become public? I assume when it's submitted to the ZBA, which again, we think by that meeting on the 10th. The 10th. Mm -hmm. And then it would be available in town hall if somebody wanted to look at it, for the example. ZBA sets or up for you know, making things available. Available. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to, can we request that we get a copy of it? That we're, um, we will. Sure, we will have yeah, a we will. copy of it. It's okay. just that, you know, if it's discussed, it right. needs to be in an open meeting. So. All right. And what are your meetings in January again? It's the 15th. You're still going to meet on the 15th, even though Kurt right. is away. 
Okay, so potentially there could be discussion at that meeting. We just have to, I think we'd have to bring the same discussion to the 22nd as well so that everything is at the that. scheduled announced continuation. I, you know. Right, we can't discuss yeah. if the hearing's been continued. No. It will not be on our agenda for the 15th. Is everybody clear? Yeah. yeah, so we should so vote all, yes. Oh, yeah. So all in favor of continuing the hearing <laughs> till January 22nd at 7.30 p.m. Say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Okay. So. Okay. So we have that taken care of. Great. Okay. So let's continue our discussion. I have to get my child. Needs to leave. I have to get my child to bed. It's <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Great. We should try to wrap up by 9 30, though. Take the cookies, though. Anyone last chance for the cookies? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We voted to continue, but not close. Right? Thank you. Did you understand that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Can I ask one follow-up sure, question please. on buffer? So please. I understand that you said that you don't need to quantify the amount of buffer that's being impacted, but you recognize that I'm assuming that buffers have some value and this project is eliminating a certain portion of the buffer. How are you going to evaluate the potential impacts of the loss of the buffer without knowing how so, much buffer? So, no, no, your assumption's wrong, okay? The buffers can be very important, right. but by we are required to assess if whatever's happening to the buffer is having an adverse impact on the resource area. That's our charge. Our charge is not to determine how much of the buffer is being impacted or any of that sort. It's to say whatever's happening to the buffer, is it going to have an adverse res effect on the resource area? But you're losing a proportion. Uh, we are. Proportion. We are. And so what we're saying is that, okay, is that proposed activity, even losing a, a lot of it, is that going to have an adverse effect on the resource area? So how are you going to determine that then? So as we talked about with regards to what Jennifer went through, we will look at the, the stormwater management plan with regard to the hydrologic characteristics that are happening. We assess what's proposed is, is the wildlife habitat value going to change in an adverse way there. Um, so that's how we determine um, if, if it's going to have an adverse effect on the resource area or not. So when we met with DP, they were really clear about the fact that the buffer zone itself is not a resource area. It's not. And so the standards that you would do in terms of compensation and, and looking at it are very different when you're just when you're doing a buffer zone only activity, which is what we're proposing. And I would suggest all across Massachusetts every day, people are working in buffer zones, but they have to do it following certain performance standards and having filed with the local CONCOM to do it. It's not that it's not happening um, in Massachusetts. I mean, we see they're proposed to put a lot of fill in the buffer zone and affect a major proportion of the buffer zone. So we see that, that's obvious. <laughs> And so what we have to ask ourselves, is that proposed activity in the buffer zone going to have an adverse effect on the resource right. area? I mean, the irony is so, that... And that's what we've been discussing for a couple months now. The irony is the purpose of the fill is to, in many ways, protect the flow of groundwater. And so I hear people saying it like it's this horrible thing that's happening, but I would also say it's one of the main tools at our disposal to keep our development out of the groundwater flow. Right. And so I don't see it as a... I see it as a mitigating thing that we're doing in terms of how we're doing the work, not a burden. Well, what I hear Margaret saying, though, if I may, is that she's worried about the compression of all that fill That's right. interfering with the groundwater flow to the, to the wetland area. In sedimentation, knowing, knowing that fill is, um, fill is not, necess not yet stable during construction, right? And also that during that post construction there will be some settling, and also that water right now flows from that corner of my property into 
into the BBW over the land. Mm -hmm. And that the proposal for this, for the water to take a right turn is quite unusual. And that that water, I, you know, if I'm that water, I'm flowing, I'm kind of pushing through that fill and um, causing sedimentation and causing causing other harm to the BBW. Okay. So let's so, deal with the first one first. So Mark, how would you address this it, this concern that the the fill will compress the substrate underneath the fill and interfere with the flow of the groundwater as it exists now? I think I tried to address that earlier. Um, it may change the rate that the groundwater, the velocity that the groundwater can flow. It may, I'm not sure that it would. But again, the groundwater travels at a very slow pace. So again, the same amount of water that's gonna go on the site before and after the same, it's gonna wind up in the same destination. It may take a little bit longer to get there, maybe a little less time to get there. Uh, but the same groundwater is gonna flow. We're not stopping it, we're not damming it. Worst case scenario, and again, I'm not sure that it would make a difference, possibly slow it down, mm -hmm. but this rate of uh, flow of the groundwater horizontally in that area is very slow anyway. Okay. We're not stopping it. The water has to go somewhere, and it's going to go in the same destination that it went before and after construction. It's going to head towards the wetlands. That's and where it's going to wind up. But not in the same manner. It's going to trans. It's going to go the same way. So I think I'm hearing you say, Margaret, it's not going to be the same hydro period or groundwater That's intersection right. with the wetland resource area, Thank post construction you. than pre construction. Uh, and so one has to say, okay, maybe, maybe not. Uh, with, uh, I mean, my, you engineers can speak to it better than I can. I mean. It's highly variable. Groundwater flow is highly variable from year to year and from season to season. And so uh, assessing if this will permanently change the hydro period of that wetland resource area uh, is unknown. But the bottom line is that it's still flowing to that wetland resource area. The same amount of water is eventually going to reach there. I think I hear Margaret saying she's concerned about the timing of that flow. Mm -hmm. and, but then, like I say, it's not constant, it's highly variable from season to season, from year to year. So with it, is it within those, that, that natural variation? Well, I don't think any of us can answer that with any certainty. Without putting monitoring wells in, very deep monitoring wells in for for decades, and looking at the natural variation in it, uh, it's, it's a, none of us can say with any certainty that uh, it will be the same or not. So I've also heard that um, there might be percolation of water coming through the retaining wall. And that, that the percolation of that water coming through the retaining wall is one of the features of that retaining wall. And it seems to me that that could also be an opportunity for um, both potentially sedimentation or um, it's, it's also an example of how that hydro period is changing. And that, that the percolation, that the percolation of that water coming through might also ca cause that retaining wall to become unstable. So I know this was addressed <laughs> specifically at an earlier meeting in terms of the engineering design with regards to the stableness of that, uh, of that wall. So um, do we need to open that discussion again? Because I thought they addressed it previously. Is the commission satisfied with their answer, Dan, are you satisfied I, I haven't heard the answer, so I, I guess you, you can give me there the answer. Uh, this is a <laughs> soil reinforced earth wall. Yep. Essentially, it's a versatile lock type of scenario with uh, geogrids coming back. Um, it's about the maximum of six feet high, mm -hmm. and it's uh, just from the very back of the building back towards the wetlands. Um, and the idea is that the wall will have a 
granular backfill behind it, the geogrid would go back beyond that, back to the building. And the only water that would possibly get there is the rainfall that fell on a very short distance between the wall and the building. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions was, well, what stabilization? And typically, you're concerned about drainage. Um, the fact that this is a articulated wall, gravel backfill, the wall is permeable. And one of the concerns about stabilization for retaining walls is hydrostatic pressure. This wall can have no hydrostatic pressure because of the nature of the construction. Um, again, the only water that would fall is with falls on the, the lawn behind the building, mm -hmm. percolates through the ground, and if it didn't go straight into the groundwater and did happen to build up, which I don't imagine it doing, if it did, it would only be an inch or so, it could have the opportunity to relieve hydrostatic pressure through the front of the wall. You've got the wall, you've got the granular backfill, and then typical uh, clean granular fill behind that. There's not a lot of flow, there's not a hydraulic pressure on there, there's no reason to push that water out. I've never seen a retaining wall oozing sedimentation, especially this new type of uh, soil reinforced earth walls. I'm satisfied with his answer. Okay. Any more questions for this evening? I do have more. that I just restated that very question earlier this evening um, off of Margaret's list. Um, and Mark talked at some length about the issue being the volume of water at those locations rather than it, the ability of those locations to take and infiltrate. But no, I think uh, the question regarding the soils at the discharge locations is the erodible velocities right. and these are grass line channels and there's acceptable velocities for grass line channels and we were greatly below that. And even if they were not grass line channels, they were erodible non-grass channels, we would still be below the erodible velocity except unless the soil were fine non-colloidal sand and we don't have an unprotected uh, fine sand non-colloidal situation. So we greatly exceed or within the parameters of a safe non-erodible channel. Soil samples are not required and are typically assumed at the outfall locations because you're not looking for a lot of infiltration at that location. No, it's strictly it's to not pre its make sure that we're not creating erosion and sedimentation problem. It's right. not for recharge at that location. Okay. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we end for the evening, unless there's any other pressing questions that haven't been addressed. Are there any? Do you have any additional ones that we haven't? I do have, I, I, I can keep, I have a list of questions, but I can continue. Well, it seems like we're revisiting questions you've had before, so that's my, if, are there any new questions that haven't been asked before, answered before, I guess is what I'd like to ask. The single event calculation, okay. you haven't discussed? Uh, we did at an earlier meeting, uh, not at this meeting, and but go ahead, go ahead and restate it so that we can 
make sure. Well, the, the single event, that none of these calculations are relevant to a single event, that they're, that, that it's a yearly average. And uh, my question to the Conservation Commission is whether you have concern that a single event could cause harm to the BBW. Mark, I think you addressed this in a previous uh, Yeah, I mean, meeting. we, a uh, single event, I mean, we analyzed uh, what would con be considered typical storms between a two-year and a hundred-year storm event. Uh, there's theoretical models. There's no real storm that follows exactly this model, but this gives us an ability to see what would happen before construction and after construction to compare the difference between those two models. That's the idea of our whole design. We're not saying if you gave us a particular exact model, how would it affect this? We could run that. But again, our goal is to determine existing conditions and propose conditions and see if there's a delta impact. And that's what we analyzed for a small storm, for a very severe storm. And we've shown that there is no delta impact. And that, but that's just for water. I'm, 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 I'm naming also a concern for um, salts from for a, from a from a snowstorm it, that that salts will be part of the maintenance of this driveway, right? And so you're going to have snow piled up, salty, sandy snow piled up, melting into the BBW, and that's those aren't those aren't those events aren't captured in just a one. Um, excuse me, those events are captured in, in that yearly analysis. You really have to look at that for one storm. Again, I think this is a question that was asked at a previous meeting that I think Mark addressed with regard to the storm, wind, storm water management plan, but could you restate? Well, I guess I'd <laughs> <laughs> we follow all the design criteria that DEP laid out. We exceed their design criteria. Every snowstorm, every salt winds up going downstream. This is not a unique, bizarre scenario from any other parking lot, uh, any other roadway within the Commonwealth. So I've heard you say, Mark, because yeah, we've covered it now a couple of times, that first of all, that there is routine kind of rainfall on this parking lot, that snow happens periodically a few times during the year. So the amount of buildup that you're going to get on that parking lot is going to be mitigated. And then the snow is piled into these areas that are outside the buffer zone, that any sands are going to kind of just drop down right into the grass and sit there, probably till someone rakes them off. Um, and that the grass and soils in that, those locations, as the, as the water travels through it, are going to capture anything else. So the distance from where the snows are piled all the way over to where the BVW is presents opportunities for things to fall out of whatever it was in that pile of snow. I think that was <clears throat> sort of brought up in the uh, maintenance requirements for the grass swales. If they do get filled full of sediment, which they possibly could, the sediment would be coming from the snow piles if that were the case. I just don't anticipate there's going to be that much sediment uh, associated with this project. I mean, most of, the, most of the sand stays on the roadway. It has to get swept up in the spring. Salt usually melts, and that's what's down on the pavement. It's not picked up in the snow. So typically, snow does not carry the salt. The salt melts down, stays on the pavement. Mm -hmm. So typically, so the snow is piled up. It's not full of salt. Right. So here. if the salt is staying on the pavement, then it's going into the infiltration going to the focal system point, uh, and getting clean. Rain gardens. Okay. Again, there's you know, several storm events, and we realize that uh, ten inches of snow is one inch of water. So it's not a it looks like a lot of snow, but it's not a whole lot of water there. And it's going to melt slowly. It's not like it's snow just going to create a flash flood. Um, and it's not a huge area regarding volume of water, made of water from the snow melt. I think we said 9.30. Can we make this the last question? Mm -hmm. Margaret, I saw you hand up. Uh, my question is whether there have been calculations done on salt specifically. How much salt does the... Um, Focal point garden removed. I don't and know how. if it has any. Well, typically, salt when it's soluble stays soluble. So that salt would run into the BBW. 
depends where it travels when it gets yeah. into the groundwater. Yeah. <laughs> but every all of the stormwater from this project is going into the BBW. That's really well established. So I'm hearing you say that there's no plan to take salt out of the water. That means the salt from the stormwater is going right into the BBW. It's going to cause pH changes. So I assume, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I assume that certain amount of the water, not every bit of water, will immediately run off into the groundwater, into the wetland. It will be retained within the treatment system as well as on the grasses, and it will some of it will very well percolate through those substrates as well and be affixed by the soil particles. But if those calculations but, haven't been done, we can't make those assumptions. So that may be true again but i'm not sure that the, the regulations require those specific things to be done um, i believe the regulation would require maintenance of um the hydrology excuse me it's not hydrology mm -hmm. the um the characteristics of the water which would include salinity I'm going to need some help here. I, don't, I can't quote those those regulatory verses per se. So uh, I'm not seeing anywhere in the stormwater handbook that salinity is needs to be addressed as part of the management system. I've seen it like an aquifer. Sometimes they'll try to limit the salt, but uh, no, I haven't seen it with stormwater calcs. And so maybe it's a calculation that's outside the storm the 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 discussion of stormwater. It's much more this project, looking at this project as a whole, and how this project as a whole will cause harm to the BBW. And one way that this project was, would cause harm is that there's no way to stop the salts that will be spread upon this pavement from entering the BBW. So we talked at the last meeting about typical property maintenance protocols. I don't know if you want to Reiterate that. Uh, you know, I, just to say that I think um, from an affordability standpoint, uh, HRA typically uses a sand salt combination or calcium chloride, and uh, you know, more sand obviously is the more, more uh, cost effective means of uh, treating surfaces. Properties are uh, then swept again in the spring, so any residual um, would be removed once the snow season is over. A resident from the Greenfield Solar Village. Oh, I will make my comment at our next meeting. Thank you. So, well, in this meeting, we're not closing the hearing, right? And right. We'll, the meeting is being continued. And the next meeting, regular meeting, will be January 15th, but this meeting will be continued on January 22nd. This hearing will be continued yeah, yeah. on January yeah. 20. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We need to approve minutes. Okay. We have them. Did you send them to you? Okay. 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 So it's from you. Motion to approve the minutes. <laughs> from the prior two meetings. <laughs> and the motion, I wasn't here at the last one, so. Sure, you can vote. I can vote. Oh, yeah, I can vote. <laughs> uh, so that was <laughs> <laughs> September 4th and December 11th. Thanks for hanging out. Stalwart attendees. December 11th? December 11th was your friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 December 4th. I gave Dominic. Very short. For you, like I had mine. So, that that has one I've been here as a newsletter of care. So, you've got to stay. You've got to stay. 
All day one is coming. That's what you that's what you write about, right? So if there is no conflict, you have no story. It's very beautiful. It's something I've learned over the years. Okay. Wow. My impression is that most of the dissolves. Doesn't last at all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for Martin. coming. Mm -hmm. This is all. So. Yeah. Is all the meeting units. Yes. All on the first floor. Oh, I forgot to put the time. Like, how many people will be able? Uh, one. Are we all here? <laughs>